All right, it's Monday, so it's time to catch up with Jay Lehman, our All-American linebacker, line acquire football analyst. We have to talk a little bit uh, about a 38-9 to loss at number one, Oregon. Oregon looked like the number one team in the country. Illinois did not look like a top-tier Big Ten team. And we look ahead to what is a huge matchup against Minnesota. The Gophers are playing good ball, and they are favored over the Illini on the road in here in Champaign here at Memorial State. Wait, how about, how about Minnesota's favored by what? Three? Uh, two and a half, three points. Yeah, it started Illinois favored two and a half, three points, but the uh, line shifted pretty quickly to the Gophers. Interesting. I love it. There's lots. We play better as an underdog anyway, so. That's right. <laughs> well, as a, other than last week. Yeah. Well, Jay, uh, the game was really over, if I'm being kind, uh, by the mid-second quarter. But uh, really, it felt like after the first two drives by Oregon that this game was kind of put away. But how much of that was Oregon? How much of that was Illinois? Uh, a lot of it was Oregon. Um, they're really good. Uh, this is a team that beat Ohio State uh, that has similar athletes uh, to them, and, and they beat Ohio State fair and square. Um, there were uh, Illinois did not play its best game. Well, uh, did not play B- Brett Bielema football as far as critical situations, turnovers, getting off the field on third down. I think there's three plays in that first quarter uh, that really dictated the whole game. It maybe could have been closer. I don't think it was a win-loss thing for Illinois, but definitely could have been a more respectable finish. And that was actually the third, first third down of the game where uh, you know Xavier Scott almost gets a PBU to, to, to break it up. And Tez Johnson, I believe, gets it down the sideline and gets a first down. You're almost off the field on a three and out in that first series. And then that first drive with Illinois, uh, it was a strange set of events officiated. I think they missed them. They obviously missed the the call um, on the face mask with Luke. But it was not explained, at least watching the TV copy. I don't know if it was there, if it was different. But Luke was not down on that play, right? And so they have a 10-yard loss to him. So now it's instead of third and five, it's third and 15. The coaches were confused. They asked to reset the play clock because they were confused on what the actual down and distance was. And then you have a three and out. So I don't know if there was there something different that was said at the game or no. Yeah, it was like such a small part in hindsight that we didn't ask about that game, but no, sure. we didn't hear anything live. And so I, I watched the game. He's not down visibly. I, even if he didn't get, if he did miss the face mask, that's fine. But it's not a sack. It was, you know, uh, and it wasn't intentional grounding. And then of course, you know, you get him in third and seventeen at the beginning of the second quarter, I believe. I believe beginning of the second quarter. Um, and you know, they get Sadiq on a, on, on a nice little screenplay. Uh, and then get that first down with a nice play on fourth and one. And so those kind of three plays, you felt like if they make one or two of those, it becomes more respectable. But what I saw, uh, you, I think it's obvious for people to see uh, on the edges, hey, there was a difference in athleticism. But, man, their big guys were so athletic, especially on the offensive and defensive line. Uh, that's where I saw the biggest thing. Uh, the biggest difference. And what's interesting about Illinois is we have seen flashes of running the football effectively the last two or three weeks. But then we will see flashes against Oregon where, you know, Luke makes the right play in the zone read, but because someone doesn't block in the interior well, he's tackled by an interior defensive lineman that's fast enough to get out there. And so there have been moments where like, this is the offensive line we thought we would see. But overall, it was not very consistent at all. Luke did not play his best game. Defensively, we didn't play our best game. And Dylan Gabriel pretty much did whatever he wanted. Yeah, uh, there were certain plays where I just tipped my cap to to Oregon. The Dylan Gabriel touchdown to uh, Justice uh, on that one where he looked off, Miles Scott threw it. Tip your cap. Like, that's one of the best uh, quarterbacks. Uh, well, there's a reason you threw for 17,000 yards in your career, right? I mean, guess going for a lot of yards. I mean, he's number three or number two all time now behind Case Keenum. But uh, they, they really struggled to contain that screen game, Jay. So what did you make of, of the defensive game plan and, and execution? We knew this was a tough test, right? I mean, right. holding Oregon under 30 is is not easy. But uh, to give up 35 in the first half, what, what went so wrong there defensively with the game plan and the execution? Well, first and foremost, we didn't get enough pressure. Some of that was the three-man rush. I know it's well documented that, you know, you're not having Gabe Ackes or Seth Coleman rushing sometimes. Uh, we didn't just get enough pressure. So a guy like Dylan Gabriel is too good of a quarterback, too good of an arm, not to make completions when he has that much time. And it, it, part of it was the offensive line. They did, they did a phenomenal job. But I would also say this. When you play a bend but, bro- bend but don't break defense, you play off more, which is going to allow you to make short passes. Now, if you can come up and make tackles in space 
on those short passes, you'll be okay. We saw them do that against other teams earlier in the year, but against Tez Johnson's, against the Sadiq's, against Justice Morris, whoever it was, they were not able, number one, to tackle these guys in space. Number two, there was some really good blocking on the perimeter against our defenders. Our guys were not able to get off. And it felt like our defensive backs were getting beat up in that first or second quarter. We had a couple of them go out for with injuries. Uh, I, you know, I think Terrence Brooks was a little bit banged up, Caleb Patterson, Torrey Cox. It's very, it was a very, very, very physical game on the edges. So when you ask, okay, how do we stop the screen game? Usually in the screen game, if you're going to play man-to-man, you'll be all over the screen. It's usually on the zone. We were playing a little bit more zone, and when we did play man, we weren't able to hug up as fast as we can. A lot of those throws were just five, six-yard pitch and catches with yards after the catch. So tackling and getting off blocks in space, especially on the back end, and we were having a trouble when it came to tackling once that uh, deep uh, uh, running back got through the initial line of scrimmage. (laughs) I mean, Miles Scott might be the one that we saw the most near the goal line, right? And it was kind of a no-win situation. You had to tackle him high. You couldn't really go low because he's going to fall into the end zone. But that was kind of a an exclamation point of what was happening to our DBs trying to tackle those big backs in space downhill. So I think of two of the last four halves um, have been struggles for the defense, giving up 46 and a half to, to Purdue, 35 and a half to sure. Oregon. Uh, Michigan obviously is, is struggling offensively. Still, you performed well uh, for, for what you were given. You're going up against, and the game plan worked. But how concerned are you about that defense? Because, man, it's really takeaway right, right now, it feels like, Jay. It really is. It, 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 our, Illinois cannot be a 9-win team, a 10-win team, with the way it's played defense in those two halves. It's just not going to happen. They might not even be a uh, you know a seven or eight win team if they play defense at that level. Um, and I told I said this after the Purdue game. We lack an eraser on this defense. Gabe Akis at times has been that when there's been breakdowns. Gabe has made a play, made a negative play, made up for some different errors. Um, Xavier Scott early in the year, I believe, was that eraser. I don't know how healthy he is after his return after the Purdue game. We haven't seen him make as many plays. Matthew Bailey can be flashy. At times, he will make some tremendous plays, but he's often in a run-pass conflict and had another tough matchup against Sadiq this this week and had a tough matchup against Colston Loveland, had a tough matchup against Max Clare the week before. There's some good tight ends in this league that make it a really tough matchup. And then uh, I I know we have depth at cornerback, but it's kind of seems a little bit like a revolving door. Caleb Patterson's probably been the most consistent guy out there uh, but he's had his share of getting banged up. Everybody's kind of had their share of getting banged up. And now you're feeling like, do you have anybody you really trust on that corner? So Jaheim Clark get some time. I saw Tyson Rooks come on in. We're digging down into the into the threes now. And I think those guys can be good players. Is The, the question I have, though, is can we play? Uh, and, and I'm talking you know, about the back end and talking about the defensive line. But I, I also think at linebacker, uh, Dylan Rosiak's making tackles. Uh, he's not tackling – great sometimes we saw him probably have his his worst tackling game since penn state but he's probably our most solid linebacker but we don't have another felt like he felt like he got off blocks really well at oregon just making the tackle was it was the issue at times you know what's interesting is that with rosiak his ability to read and his ability to get off blocks and what we call block destruction has never really been his issue he plays with really good pat level i think what's been tough for rosiak is sometimes he's gotten there and not made the play except in overtime he makes the play every time uh and, and, you know, his his instincts, and I, I'm talking as someone who, who had instincts, but maybe not the best speed, his instincts make up for some of his lack of speed. What ended up happening when they got on the edge, there was just too much speed for anybody to have a good angle tackling. So much of tackling is getting a proper angle to begin with. If you have a bad angle to begin with, it's going to be hard to bring down Dylan Gabriel. It's going to be hard to bring down uh, uh, who was running back Sanders, Jordan Johnson, some, Jordan somebody. James. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan James, right? Jordan James. So like, it's going to be hard. And so they were out running our angles. We weren't tackling well. We've got to have uh, Rosiak and Akis have been the best at being erasers in that front seven. They struggled in this game. Xavier Scott earlier in the year had been better at that. Matthew Bailey at times, but it's just not on a consistent level that you need to be a great defense. And I'm concerned because I look at you know the D, uh, uh, Minnesota, I look at Michigan State. I feel like these teams are improving at a good clip, 
And you could say that Illinois was improving maybe after the Michigan game or maybe Purdue offensively they were improving. You, you, you feel like you really got to shake this one off, though, because you really got beat bad by a team you're really overmatched against. I know you guys have heard me talk about Home Field Apparel a lot, but there's a reason. I have some of these shirts from Home Field Apparel, and they are a premium collegiate apparel brand based in Indianapolis. And what I love about them is they're focused on creating incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. So go to homefieldapparel.com and check out their Illini gear. The Flying Illini t-shirt I love. If they have any bomber jackets, go check those out. But you see all of these vintage designs that are great. So they kind of stand out in a crowd. But also, these are comfortable, well-fitting. They're not the boxy kind of ones you get at the random department store. No, these are well-fitted, comfortable t-shirts and apparel. So go check it out at homefieldapparel.com. Go to the drag down menu, click on Illini, and you'll see all of these great shirts, including Orange Crush, old school fighting Illini basketball shirts, the flying Illini t-shirt with the great winged logo, script Illini gear, including t-shirts, hoodies, an orange ringer tee, the 2004-05 Illinois basketball shirt so you can relive those glory days, but also they have great hoodies, great crewnecks, great Illini football gear, including the 80s Illini helmet on there. If you're an old school sweatshirt guy, they got those. If you're a quarter zip guy, they got those. If you want a women's tank there with the script Illini, they got that. So go to homefieldapparel.com to check out all the great gear they have there. And if you're not an Illini fan, they have more than 180 plus growing list of schools so you can check out all the gear from all over the country and right now use code illini24 for 15 percent off at homefieldapparel.com that's illini24 for 15 percent off all the gear at homefieldapparel.com feels like the first time maybe this season that i can say confidently that luke altmeyer did not play well uh, sure. in this one jay um one he's really loose with the ball uh when he's in that pocket but just he didn't see the field all that well, in my opinion. What what did you see from him? Because it, it does feel like the first game, like you know, last game there were some missed throws, but I thought he performed well and helped Illinois win. This one, uh, it just didn't feel like you got the play you needed out of your quarterback. I don't think number one, his his accuracy has been so on point. I'd say through the first seven, uh, six games of the season, he was a really accurate passer. I mean, close to seventy percent. The accuracy hasn't been there, and I think. Um, I think his feet were a little bit happy this week. I don't think his feet were necessarily happy last week, but he's playing against better defensive teams. Uh, Michigan's a better defensive team and the windows are tighter. Okay. And we've seen Pat Bryant struggle a little bit to get as open or win as many battles as he has. They've tried to give him the ball. One thing I'll, uh, uh, I'll give credit to Zachary Franklin. That guy can get open against anybody. Uh, he has a way about him. Uh, very slippery, very crafty. They do some stuff to give him the ball in the flat, just like they do with Pat on the slant. Um, but man, he's really good when you give him a chance on a ball. And so uh, zakari has been playing at a very, very high level the last couple of weeks. He's always been playing at a high level. Um, Pat, I think uh, he's got teams really, he, he's a true number one receiver. He's got teams really focused on him, bracketing him. They're putting their best defensive back on him. And it's a new challenge. I, and, I, and I think Pat's up for the challenge, but it hasn't helped him that Luke hasn't been that accurate. And number three, uh, there wasn't great protection, right? Um, but when he did, when we did move the ball some, it seemed like the ball was getting out quick, right? It seems like we had some rhythm to it. And uh, we, we've worked the flat game really well with Zakari in motion and sometimes Tanner Arkin. Colin Dixon usually gets the first pass of the game. So we use some of that stuff but there's just not enough time to get rhythm as we go. And I think a lot of that um, can be there. It's good that the run game has kind of picked up the void of the passing game the last two weeks, but man, our passing game and run game have never really clicked in one game, except maybe for Nebraska in that second half. I want to say one of the positives of this game is just, you couldn't do it much because you were down so big early is you sure. have run the football well against two yeah. defenses the last couple of weeks. Aiden Lawfrey's had a couple of explosives. Maybe Zakari got away with a block in the back there. Right. Uh, but Khalil Valentine came in, gave you some good yards. Josh McCray, I think has been solid. So what, what are you seeing about with that committee at running back and the offensive line kind of, well, you know, getting some yards here? You know, Brett probably said two weeks ago in this press conference, Aiden Lawfrey's as healthy as he's been since the beginning of the year. I think Aiden Lawfrey got healthy. 
I think he got a little bit banged up with the soft tissue issue. And what's been good to see is that he looks like he has some burst to it uh, to get in and out of the hole. I, I still don't feel like he's Chase Young, get to the edge. You know, you felt like Chase, when he got to the edge, he would go. Maybe Aiden will get there. I know he's got top end speed. Khalil Valentine, I really like him because he's different than everybody else we have. And McRae, you, you know what you're getting with McRae. It's not going to be flashy. He's going to block, catch the ball in the backfield, and he's been running harder. So I like what they're doing uh, running the ball. We, we really miss Luke's running ability in this game. And like you mentioned, his ball security has been an issue, especially when he runs the football. Not so much when he gets sacked, but when he runs the football as he's going down, that's usually when runners are relaxing to catch themselves the fall. Ball moves away from the body. Defenders are taught to, as you're trying to take a hit on the guy, get your hand on the ball. We've seen three or four fumbles that way. And, you know, he's recovered most of them or had his stuff overturned, but it, it could be painful down the line. But as far as the offensive line goes, I know Coach Bielema said that um, Josh Geske played his best game last week against two really good defensive tackles. I thought that wedge played great. Uh, I think um, – between uh, Crutes getting to the second level, as we saw in some of the draw plays. We also saw Brandon Henderson, who seems kind of a mauler. I think you have what you want. You have the athletic guys on the in, a, a, a outside. You have your mauler and Henderson and Gaskin, really your smart player that can get up to the second level with Crutes. But the level of consistency is just not there. Sometimes they look great, Jeremy. Other times they got completely beat off of the line of scrimmage by some of these Oregon defensive linemen, either stunting or just beating them up front. And I don't necessarily have an answer for it, but it's there on the tape and you can see that they can block these guys sometimes, but the level of consistency to keep drives going and to really take over games to the run game is just not there. I don't know if it's technique. I don't know if it's playing lower. I don't know if it's just better competition, but it hasn't been the level of consistency that we need at Illinois to win games and take over games in the second half. One thing that I feel like has been an issue uh, on that interior sometimes has been communication uh, against blitzes, right? And th there was one play in particular where Oregon had seven guys on the line of scrimmage. You know, like, they're going to blitz, we'll right. figure out who – like, I don't know who it's going to be, but they had s ended up sending everybody. There was third down. You had four wide receivers. And I feel like Luke's got to know to get rid of the ball quickly and be aware that th this is coming. But also, you didn't – they didn't block the guy in the interior. Jordan Anderson looked like he was late coming in. So take me through what what does communication got to be uh, on, on third and eight, and, and you need to get rid of the ball or you need to pick up a blitz so Luke has a little bit of time. Yeah, well, first off, it's basic math. I mean, you know if if they're bringing, um, you know, six or seven, let's say an empty set and they bring six, the ball has to come out because, you know, there's only five to block six and it's one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody's got to win. Uh, in that case that we saw, they had seven up on the line of scrimmage. And Jordan Anderson was kind of in a in a strange alignment. I'm probably two yards behind, and it didn't look like he recognized or, or had time to get over to get to where the linebacker who was coming right through the A-gap. So uh, in any blitz, you, if, if you have an all-out blitz, it's, hey, let's secure the A-gaps and the B-gaps because that's the closest to the quarterback. They didn't do that. So number one, there has to be communication on everything. Hey, secure A, B, and C if they come off the D or whatever. That's what you do. That's the number one thing. Number two is uh, Luke's got to realize like, okay, I have one, maybe two seconds to throw this ball. What is my best route here? And if I don't have that route, I've got to check to some kind of hot route yeah. to get to my best guy. Right. And, and know, Hey, I've got to get it out now. And maybe that's in one thing that I think we're, we're missing is that was a typical Isaiah Williams throw last year, right? Where you yeah. get him in the slot, he's on the nickel, he's close to the quarterback. It's not a long throw, He's close. We just don't have that right now. And I have well, on, on that play on that play specifically, like Hank Beatty was six yards down the field, no one around him. And, and I'm just like quarterback, like get, you got to right. get rid of it. So I understand like there was a missed block. The the protection didn't take care of itself, but also it feels like quarterbacks just got to get rid of the ball. See if Hank can get to the first down marker, but at least you can gain some yards and set up maybe a fourth down and short or something. I don't, yeah. I don't think he, I don't think Luke has seen the field as well as he has seen it the last uh, the first five or six games, the last two games, he wrote, this doesn't, it, there's some guys that are just open. We saw Malik Elzey open. Uh, you just mentioned Hank Beatty. He, I, I get that you have two guys in, in Pat Bryant and Zakari, you got to get them the ball. Uh, we just, we just can't lock in on that. And so sometimes you feel like that's what we push it. You felt like he got anxious and pushed that ball to Zakari when 
the safety did make a good play, but it wasn't even an accurate ball where Zakari could make a really a play on it, right? Um, and and I, I want to see us get get back to our bread and butter. Dude, run a couple slants to, to Pat Bryant on the uh, on the RPO. Like, he's a really good slant receiver. So is Zakari. Yeah. Go back to that bread and butter, especially as you're running the ball in the interior a little bit better. That play, what's great about that is it kind of takes the offensive line out of the picture to a degree. I mean, you don't have to protect that much. I just – the ball's going to be out. And so you're protecting Luke, getting some easy throws and getting him back in rhythm. The one thing I think we were both concerned about coming into these last four games that are very winnable for Illinois is injuries heading into November, right? And Pat Bryant – this is, we're discussing this, Jay, before Brett Bielma talks, so right. we'll get an update on him. But it, it sure looked like a concussion – um, and then the defensive backs, you had three, four guys go out of that game. So th this is the concern you have with, with a program like Illinois. When you get in November, uh, even if the games look pretty winnable, these injuries start to mount up. And depth, you saw Oregon, how much depth that program has. Yeah. When, when they can just throw in Sadiq at tight end, it's like, oh, that guy looks like a future NFL guy too. Right, right away. And, you know, I, I'm going to go a little sideways here and talk about what Matt Rule talked about in his press conference about the portal bringing um, – more, you know, uh, continuity, not continuity, but parity among the teams. And he said it used to be that these top teams used to just stockpile all the talent. So if an injury, next guy goes in, right? And so, uh, but that what ends up happening is that the portals allowed talent to, to go to different places and people can, you know, maybe Alabama can only pay, we'll pay this guy a million, but only pay this guy 50,000, but we'll pay him a hundred thousand to come here, you know? And so we can outpay some people. And I say that because I believe there is at least to a degree, a little bit better depth at Illinois in the defensive backfield than we've had. And a lot of that's attributed to the portal, Tory Cox, Terrence Brooks, um, you know, I think they did a good job on Caleb Patterson, the eval out of, out of I think, Pearl City Juco, right? I mean, to, to get that, uh, turning Miles Scott from a receiver to that. Matthew Bailey was a recruiting find. That has really been a hit, a guy that wasn't super highly touted on Moline. So, like, in this specific group, they've done a decent job. But you can't weather three, four injuries. You can do one or two injuries, right? You get three or four, and then you start to have some holes on your defense What's different with, with Oregon, and they've definitely got more NIL money. I mean, I think Phil Knight has made it pretty clear they're, they're, they want to win a national championship in Oregon. Um, they got guys that could just come right in, right? They, 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 and you don't feel like they necessarily miss a beat on athleticism. Maybe game experience, right? Yeah. Maybe savviness, but that athleticism is still there. And so, um, yeah, Illinois, if there's going to be an injury issue, though, not that we'd ever want that. Defensive back is probably the spot where you're the deepest, right? You're not deep at linebacker. We've seen one or two linebackers get all the playing time. You're not deep at D-line, although Alex Bray and Joe Barna, uh, Pat Farrell have showed flashes, right? You're not that deep, though. You're, you're a little bit deeper at guard because you've had a little rotation on the offensive line. Um, and we've, we've been banged up at running back some, right? So, um, yeah, the depth issue is an issue as we get into this home stretch. And so can Illinois finish – well, they didn't finish well two years ago. Um, they were really competitive last year, but lost some close games down the stretch. If they can finish well, it can still be one of the best seasons. I'm not like saying the season's over. Oh, that's a, listen. I've been in many overmatched football games. Um, I've been overmatched. Uh, people might say we were overmatched against USC. It certainly felt like that, right? Mm -hmm. The first quarter or two, we were able to make kind of a comeback and stop USC on six or six straight drives. But we weren't ever able to get make it feel like a game, except when it was 21-10 for a little bit, right? Yeah. But we, I felt that before, and I felt like it's pretty clear Illinois is not a top five team. That's pretty clear. Are we a top 20, top 25 team? Yes, we are. We are that. We just aren't a top five team right now. Well, Jay, you mentioned it. Like, there's still a lot to play for here. I mean, maybe, I mean, the Big Ten championship hopes are, are gone. You got two losses now. Like, the college football playoff, I think it was 4% ESPN had Illinois with the chance to, to, to go their way. Um, but there's only been four 10 win seasons at Illinois. You at least have a chance to do this. There's sure. only been eight nine plus win seasons. Um, so you still got a chance to do that. And if I would have told you before the season that you have a chance to get to eight plus and, and have a good year, like that would have been a really, really good <laughs> year. So um, listen, I, I think if you win three out of the last four, you feel great um, with what you're doing, but um, there's still a lot for this team to play for. So I'm really interested 
I think they should be beat Rutgers. I think they should beat Northwestern despite those being road games. But the next two, I think, are significant for kind of how we feel about how they finish the season because that obviously has been an issue for them the last couple of years is finishing strong. Oh, one thing, though, I was really pleasantly surprised to see. You felt like after that Penn State loss, they had the bye week, they did some analysis, and they came out in that Purdue first half, and it really flushed that loss. Um, can they really flush this loss? I, I hope so. This loss doesn't define them. I mean, nobody expected them to actually go out there and win. Now that they lost some momentum, you could say yes. Did they lose ugly? Yes. But, man, there is – there. so – you you could finish this season two and two. Which I certainly don't want to do that and say, hey, man, eight wins. That's way more than what we thought. But it feels like if you don't have three wins, you don't have at least a nine win season with what you have in front of you, that your team didn't finish as strong as they could have, right? Doesn't mean it's a bad year. And I think that's going to come down to Luke Altmeyer, really. Luke Altmeyer is the key for this football team. The only reason they were five and one with what I would say is average front seven and average offensive line play, middle of the pack, I'm not saying they're horrible, was Luke Altmaier. Luke Altmaier is the secret sauce behind this team. Not really a secret. He's the quarterback. He's the, he's the secret to making this team really win. When he's on, Illinois is going to be in every game they play down the stretch. No question. And if they have the ball last, I'm putting my money on Luke that Illinois wins that football game. But if Luke Altmaier is not on, or inaccurate, or getting turnovers, or fumbling the football, or doesn't have time to throw the football, or doesn't have Pat Bryant playing because maybe Pat may, we don't know, be banged up. It could be a totally different story. And so that's where it just, I hate to put all the pressure on the quarterback, but it does right on the quarterback. He's the guy that the reason we were five and one to start and six and one late, you know, I, I don't give him the credit really for the Michigan win, but the reason we were yeah. five and one through that first, it was Luke Altmaier. If he can play at the level he's capable of, we're going to be just fine. If not, we're going to struggle. Well, Jay, uh, Minnesota is, as of this morning, a two, two and a half point favorite, depending on which uh, sports book you look at. Okay. Started the year two and three, uh, but they've now won three straight, including an impressive win against USC. Now they've right. taken care of uh, UCLA and, and Maryland, who look like two of the worst programs in the Big Ten right now. But um, what, what do you make of, of Minnesota uh, kind of coming on strong here? Because they're playing good ball. Okay, so I'm going to give props to Minnesota. I'm going to hate on Minnesota for a little bit. This is a team that that got beat by North Carolina. Not a good not a good football team for North Carolina this year. Uh, this is North Carolina. North Carolina got beat by James Madison, who is a good program. They gave up like 70 to James Madison, okay? Um, they got beat by Michigan, actually pretty handily to start, and then they came back in the fourth quarter, okay? UCLA is garbage. I don't know how much uh, Coach Foster is going to be there, but probably not that much longer if you're a UCLA alum. I know he took out as the interim interim status. I actually don't think USC is that good. I mean, they have got some horrible defensive players. And Maryland, this is the same team that got beat by Northwestern, 37 to 10. Okay, they're playing some undisciplined ball. I like Mike Loxley a lot, but the reality is they're not playing good football right now. And it seems like Talia Tonga-Viola he's the guy that really erased a lot of the discrepancies that they had because he was so talented at the quarterback position, at least at the, at the collegiate level. Okay. So that's ragging on their schedule. Okay. Let's talk about what Minnesota does, does well. And that is the, you know, they're going to run the football with Darius Taylor. You know that um, they're going to have a prototypical Minnesota quarterback. That doesn't mean they're going to tear you up. I mean, Max Brosman, I think was an FCS guy, maybe New Hampshire or somewhere in, yep, in New Hampshire. And they got him out of the portal and he does enough for them. Right. And he's done more so lately uh, as far as throwing the football. But what's different about this team is I really like the defensive guys, Lindenberg at linebacker and Corey Parrish at safety. It seems like they have one or two difference makers on defense. And I think that has been the key for them to get stops. And then they pay PJ play PJ flight ball and control the flock the clock, which is what Brett Bielema wants to do. This is going to be a tough game, okay? This will be a tough game. I know Brett has his number until now. That doesn't matter this year, and so I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out. What do you think are the keys for Illinois on both sides of the ball here against the Gophers? Well, number one, I believe that success on first down is so paramount against Minnesota. 
If we can run the ball in similar fashion, how we ran against Michigan and how we ran at times against Oregon, it really sets up the RPO to get Pat Bryant, Zachary Franklin going, and it sets up the Luke Altmyer run game. So when we're better on first down, we're going to be much more manageable on third. We've got to stay out of third and long. Number two, our best players got to play like they're our best players. As Ron Zook used to tell me and everybody else, if you say you're an A-plus player, but you go out on game day and give me a D-plus performance, you are a D-plus player or a D player, right? You, like A-plus players got to play. That means Zakari's got to play good. Uh, we we got to have Pat Bryant play good. We got to have Luke play good. We got to have J.C. Davis be on this game, right? We, we got to have Rosiak be, be a baller. We got to have Matt Bailey. So your best players got to play well, okay? Number three is this. You have got to control the clock and not play from behind against Minnesota. You will not get as many possessions as you want because they will start to eat up the clock with their run game and you'll be playing catch up. Much like they did in 2022, Illinois did in Minnesota. I think they could possess the ball for like 30, 35, 36 minutes. And maybe even 40 minutes that game, Minnesota never had a chance. That's what you got to do offensively, okay? And, and Luke, as we talked about, he makes everything go. I think defensively, it all starts with stopping the run. If you can stop the run against Minnesota, they're not going to have much chance. Do they have – oh, what's his guy? What, is it Daniel Jackson? Was he Good a, point. He, him and Zakari are played similarly, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wasn't he out of Kankakee who got beat out? Uh, was Jackson. he out of Kankakee? No, that was oh, Jair Hill. Oh, was it? Okay, Jair. Jair Hill was Michigan, but there was a guy out of Kankakee, I thought, that they beat us out probably five or six years ago. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if Daniel Jackson – he seems like he's been there since since – Tyler, whatever's been there. Uh, not Tyler. Who was not Tyler Newman? Who was the who was the receiver that was really Tanner Morgan? Oh, I thought you were thinking of Tanner Morgan uh, oh, there for no, a Tanner second. Was there forever. Who was the receiver that was really Tyler Jackson? He played at Minnesota. Tyler North. Johnson. Tyler Johnson. He's been there since Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson's been there for a minute. Like Daniel Jackson's been there. So I think number one, you stop the run. Number two, um, no, number two is you make Max Borsma beat you with his arm. And number three, you win the time of possession. Now, that's the offense and defense. We got to also get back to why we won the, 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 the close games. How do we win the close games? We won the turnover battle. Red zone, we were good. We haven't been good in red zone in our bigger games, right? Red zone. Third down, all right? Turnovers. And something we weren't good at last week, which I thought we might have the edge in, was special teams. Robertson didn't play well. We didn't have some of our great returns. We got to win those five things because that's the difference maker in even games. And you've talked about this. Not a lot of margin for for uh, for Illinois football in Big Ten games and the games they win. Oh, uh, you're thinking of Chris Altman Bell out of Bishop Mac. Yeah. Chris Altman came. Bell. There we go. He was there forever, too. <laughs> he was there forever. Today. I got that all back, back, messed up. Minnesota used to come and get a bunch of players from Illinois. That's kind of stopped with Brett, I think. Yeah, no, like Minnesota did that. That was kind of the underrated team that kind of came in here because we know about Iowa, we know about Wisconsin, but Minnesota. Speaking of recruiting, I asked Brett last Monday about how to capitalize in recruiting and what you can do to capitalize in recruiting. And Jay, he like voiced some stuff that coaches normally don't voice. He's like, we need money. <laughs> we need NIL because we've increased it, but we're still like 12th to 13th. Um, so I found that interesting. So if you want to comment on that, but uh, also like, where, where do you think they need areas to be addressed? Because obviously those were on display a little bit. at all. Yeah. So I'm going to give some context. I had a chance to talk to Brett when he first took the job. And I think one of the, one of the appealing things about a job at Illinois um, was who they played on a, on a yearly basis in the big 10 West. I think Brett was very familiar with every one of those programs, whether it be Iowa coached under Kirk uh, had, had Paul Christ on his staff at Wisconsin uh, knew Pat Fitzgerald really well at Northwestern. Uh, Nebraska, people kind of thought that Frost was a sinking ship anyway. Uh, knew P.J. Fleck and how P.J. played. And then you you, you had Brahm as kind of the wild card of just the maverick of, of what their offensive style was. And you'd say, man, when, I, when you take this this job four years ago, um, it's a draft. There's no port. There's no NIL. There is some portal stuff. So I'm not saying, but there's no real NIL. Not a portal as it is the degree now. It's only gotten bigger. It's a totally different job, right? It's a totally different job. And you've heard Brett say it like, I, I got the same amount of time as anybody in any given day. As long as it's fair, I'm good with competing. You kind of got the hint that the game they were about to play last week against Oregon, it really wasn't fair because, you know, I think I, think I heard you say this with Joe in a podcast. 
20 million NIL to 8 million. We don't know. We don't have a, there's not an right. NIL reporting agency. Okay. We don't know. They're, they're so they're, they're guesses in the dark, right? But the discrepancy is probably about right. It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's probably, it's probably about that. And according to Brett, they were 14 out of 14 last year of, of big 10 teams. Um, and Illinois basketball is number one. Hence we are basketball school, I guess, but, <laughs> but I, I would say this, it's a totally different world for Brett than when he took off, took the job on. Okay. So, He's had to change a lot of different things. I, I think he learned his lesson in 2023, not capitalizing maybe on some of the portal stuff, or maybe he didn't have money to capitalize like he thought he would to capitalize on the success of 2022. But if you look at this, this program, number one, I think for Illinois, you've got to, as a lower level program, focus first on retention of your good players. You've got to retain Luke Altmaier. Oh, whatever that takes. I don't know if he's on a multi-year deal. I don't know if it's like year to year. I don't know if it's like touchdown base. I have no clue. But whatever you got to do to keep Luke Altmaier in school and also at this school, uh, do what you got to do. Okay. So that's number one. Um, number two is other good players that you have. Um, you got you got to keep them. Luke Altmaier being number one. Well, and, and, like I, I just talked to people this year. I know like getting the flashy four star, like a Terrence Brooks is, is great. And like JC Davis, Kari Franklin, right. Dennis Briggs, big additions. But think of how important it was to keep Pat Bryant. Think of how important it was to keep Gabe Ackes. Like right. that's, that's where a lot of their NIL is going. And, and that is valuable. I know it doesn't show up on the transfer right. portal rankings, but if you lost those guys, look what happens to Purdue. Like Illinois would not be probably a winning team without some of these guys. Well, you, you saw what happened at Purdue and, and, and when, um, uh, Nick Scorton, who went to yep. Texas A&M, top 10 draft pick probably this year. Uh, Dion, what's his name? Uh, Burks. Dion Burks, receiver. And then, it is, it, I mean, those are two erasers on offense and defense that left. So I think you, you got to keep it. How do, we, how do we get Gabe Backus to come back? I, I don't I don't necessarily see Gabe Backus transferring, but I would see Gabe Backus potentially going to the NFL the way he's been playing the last two or three games. How, how do you keep your best players here, right? And so I think that's critical. Um, I, and then what do we have to address? So I'm not having to give me a specific order here. I think offensive line, do you wish they would have played better? Uh, yeah, I wish they would have played better, but you've actually got some up and coming guys. And you got most of your offensive line returning. So I don't think, I think the running back room, you've got most of your guys returning, right? Hey, Khalil should take a step, right? Like yeah. get, a, get a full off season, like Khalil and Caden and Aiden. Oh. Like, I feel like that. I know people right now would like another running back. I think there's still a lot of upside with the hundred percent, hundred percent. So I, I do think you're going to have to go to the portal and get one experienced receiver. Although there is some depth. I mean, they were high on Ashton Hollins in camp. I mean, he got banged up a little bit. What can he do uh, when he gets healthy coming back? Will we ever see Canary Wiltshire get the reps that maybe – he needs to get in order for him to stay here and have an opportunity and play. Colin Dixon looks like he's going to be a very, very good player. And you might move Colin Dixon outside so you can get Wiltshire and Beatty on the inside. But you feel like you need either a burner, and maybe that's Kapka Jones who has some real good speed, or, or, or somebody with some real speed and length on the outside. And I know they're recruiting this, right? I mean, they're trying to get that, but can you get a guy out of the portal offensively? Yeah. Uh, Jay, last thing I want to ask you about um, is oh, and defensively. Sorry, I would love to see the defensive line. Monroe is a premium. We're losing T. Rob. We're losing Dennis Briggs. I believe they're out of eligibility, but I do think Alex Bray is going to be a good starter for us. I think Barnard is going to fill in at the outside linebacker position uh, if as Coleman's out after this year. Yeah. I think Alex Bray has another year. I would like to see get more depth at linebacker. I, I think we need a linebacker in there along Rosiak. Uh, I think James Cruz can be good. His hand's been hurt. I don't know how healthy he is. I don't know how healthy Oda Luga is. I think we're going to have a lot of depth to the defensive back position, but we tend to get banged up at defensive back, so maybe we need more. Sorry. I wanted to just say defensively we need some specialists. I think we're doing really good. I think Hugh's got one more year, and Alano has been has been, has been been great. Does Hugh have one more year or no? He's 35. Uh, so I, Hugh I does know. have another year. Yeah, so so I get mixed up on these guys that are 30. You've been a police officer before. So uh, thanks for your service, to Australia. Uh D line linebacker definite needs and edge could be one now that I'm interested in to see if they address. Last one for you, Jay. Huge game. Ohio State at Penn State. There's a four-way race for the Big Ten championship with Oregon looking like it'll get there. Indiana is undefeated in the Big Ten before uh they get Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State, Purdue. So 
maybe they only get one loss. They have a real chance at the Big Ten championship game, but this, this is a must win, right, for Ohio State or Penn State probably to get there. I think for Ohio State, definitely, because Ohio State's got that loss to Oregon. Penn State um, – they got Ohio State, Washington, Purdue, Minnesota, Maryland. So, yeah, they could still get in with a loss, but uh, we, if they you, win this, I feel great about them getting there. We could all, every, I, think, I think everybody's going to have one loss except Oregon. So it's going to come down to Ohio State, Penn State, Indiana. Ohio State's the only team, I think, that plays both those teams. Mm -hmm. Penn State, Indiana. Um, Indiana's a good football team. I, I mean, I, I think a more and more believer, Coach Signetti, is – He's got an incredible story and, and what he's doing is special. It's, you know, I think we're always a little jealous, of Illinois, if Indiana or somebody gets good, but it's good to, it's good for the big 10 as well. But uh, when I look at Ohio state, Penn state, I got a chance to watch a little bit of that Penn state uh, Wisconsin game. Wisconsin played them actually very similar to, to Illinois kind of hung around for a half, took the lead for a little bit uh, near the end of the first half. And they were able to cut you know, some that we weren't able to do. But they really got overpowered late. Remember that Drew Aller didn't play in the second half. Um, so I think that is a big, uh, as far as their passing attack goes. Now, as we know, Andy Kotelnicki has got some real tricks up his sleeve as far as a run game between their quarterback number nine, which I forget his name, and then Tyler Warren, 44, and their two running backs. So uh, I still think Ohio State wins this football game. I think they've got way too much explosion offensively, although it sure didn't look like against Nebraska. Uh I do think they're going to win it. I think Oregon has showed it's the best in the class right now of all the teams in the Big Ten. They are the best. And what's interesting is we're seeing Oregon and Ohio State will probably, in my opinion, end up being the top two teams. They are also probably the top NIL teams uh, in the conference, if not top five in, in the country. Uh, and I guess it. I guess it helps you out, right? It's like it's kind of like the Yankees and Dodgers. They got pretty big payrolls too, right? So. That's right. That's right. That's probably the best comp in sports is MLB with the unlimited payrolls. Well, Jay Layman, uh, appreciate you as always. Big month ahead for Illinois football to see how they end this season if they can make the most of a, a really good six and two start. So thanks for making us football smarter. We'll talk to you next week, man. Yes, dude.